Hi everyone, welcome back to Monroe City Schools TV. My name is Miss Mainring and I'm from Cypress Point University Elementary. Today we are going to be starting a brand new unit on hurricanes and we are going to identify emotions about hurricanes. So hopefully in front of you, you have a pencil and a piece of paper. If you do not have that, I want you to pause this video or run and grab that really quick before we get started. So, like I said, we're starting a new unit about hurricanes. Now, I know all of us are from Louisiana, so we've all probably heard the word hurricane before. Maybe you've seen a picture like this, or you've heard of hurricanes like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Rita, Andrew, Barry, Dorian, Gustav, or Betsy. So, but to this today and over the next few weeks, we are going to be really diving in and learn what is a hurricane and how does it affect Louisiana. So our goals for this unit, these are our goals for the next um, like 10 weeks. Our goals are to learn about hurricanes and their impact on Louisiana and people all over the world. Well, I know here in Louisiana, we know about hurricanes. We've heard th about them before, but hurricanes aren't special to Louisiana. They actually happen all over our entire world. And even today and this week, we will learn about hurricanes that are in different parts of the um, globe. And then our next goal is that we will analyze firsthand and secondhand accounts of events to determine that learning about history involves the sharing of memories. So today we are going to read Surviving Hurricanes and we are going to and we are going to discuss and identify um, in the text how people might feel before, during, and after a hurricane. So before we read, I want you to brainstorm. We need to ask ourselves, what emotions and feelings might people experience before, during, and after a hurricane? So even if you haven't experienced a hurricane, I want you to think about, hmm, have you ever experienced bad weather? Have you ever um, been outside when it was storming a lot? Maybe tornadoes were around? Because we you know a hurricane is just a really big storm. So have you ever experienced bad weather? I want you to think about that. Then I want you on your own, on your paper in front of you, I want you to draw a chart kind of like mine. Are you ready? Okay, so let's talk about it. How might someone feel during or before a hurricane? Well, I know if there's, if I know that bad weather is coming, I might feel a little anxious. So before a hurricane, I think people might feel anxious or nervous. They may also feel scared. Great job. So now I want you to think about how would you feel during a hurricane? If you were in the middle of a hurricane and the storm was passing over you, how would you feel? I want, I'm going to give you five seconds. Now yell out to me, how would you feel? Okay, you might feel scared. Yeah, I think I would definitely feel scared. You may also, someone may have said you may feel terrified. There's bad weather coming, I would feel scared too. And now lastly, I want you to think about how would someone feel after a hurricane? After the storm has passed, they're okay, but how they feel after. Think about, have you ever experienced a bad storm? What do the storm leaves? What does it leave behind? Maybe trees are blown down. Maybe houses are destroyed. Okay. So that may, may, that may make me feel maybe sad. Yeah, I may also feel 
um, maybe lonely if there's no one, um, no one with me and my, I'm, my house is destroyed, I may feel lonely. Great job. Today, we are going to be reading about two hurricanes, and we are going to add to this chart as we read. So I want you to keep your chart in front of you, and if you have something a little bit different than me, that's okay. Let's see if we can find these emotions or any others in what we read today. So as we read Surviving Hurricanes, I want you to write down how the characters feel before during and after the hurricane. All right, so we are going to first read about Galveston, Texas in 1900. Sarah Little John, who was eight years old in 1900, lived in Galveston, Texas. Galveston sits on an island in the Gulf of Mexico, about 3.2 kilometers or two miles off the coast of Texas. The summer of 1900 had been one of the hottest on record. Finally, on Saturday, September 8th, a cool breeze began to blow. Sarah spent that Saturday morning playing with her friend, Minnie Borden. In the afternoon, Minnie went home and Sarah's father returned from work. He had news. He had spoken to the local meteorologist who was predicting a hurricane. Like most people in Galveston, Sarah's family would stay, ho stay at home and wait for the storm to pass. There was no safe place to go. And I see down here at the bottom, we have a map. And it's the route of the Galveston hurricane. Our caption says, the hurricane had hit Galveston, crossed over Cuba on its way west. Now I want to stop right here. And I want you to think about, how do you think Sarah felt before the hurricane? I see here, um, she had been playing with her friend that was happy. And then all of a sudden, they had to go and stay at home. And it says in our text, there was no safe place to go. How would you feel if you had to stop playing with your friends and stay at home because there was no safe place to go? Going back over here, I think that may make me feel scared. So since Sarah felt scared too, I'm going to put a check mark by scared. That's more evidence that before a hurricane, you might feel scared. Let's continue reading. Daily life. In 1900, meteorologists watched the sky and the ocean for clues about the weather. They measured air temperature, wind speeds, and air pressure. High temperatures, wind speeds, and low pressure may indicate that a powerful storm is on its way. Today, Meteorologists depend on radar and satellite pictures of storm systems. Weather predicting has improved since 1900. We have a picture here of a house. Um, if you can see on your screen, this house is completely sideways. And our caption says, The huge floods that can accompany hurricanes are strong enough to force houses from their foundations. So this house was lifted from its foundation during the hurricane. Was there anything on this page that talked about Sarah's emotions before, during, and after the hurricane? I don't think so. Let's keep on reading. A scream in the night. The tide was high. Waves crashed against the shore. Soon, water filled the streets of Galveston. Strong winds blew shutters off houses, carried away sheds, and sent tree branches flying. Sarah's father helped neighbors to nail windows and doors shut. By 6 p.m. that evening, water covered the first floor of Sarah's house. When everyone went upstairs, they found that the roof was leaking and the beds were wet. They crowded into one ba bathroom to stay dry. Sarah heard someone scream. She later wrote, The sounds we heard that night were just dreadful. We have a picture at the bottom of a little boy sitting on all of this broken wood. And it says, children had nowhere to go after the Galveston hurricane. 
This boy is playing around in debris left by the disaster. So I want to stop again and I want you to think about what we've read on this page. I see here that it says that Sarah wrote, the sounds we heard that night were just dreadful. She also heard someone scream. How would you feel if you heard someone scream? Yeah, typically you're screaming because you're, they're scared or they're terrified, right? If you hear someone scream in the middle of the night, you may be thinking, what's going on? I don't like this. And I'm sure that's how Sarah felt too. She was scared or terrified. I think that also if I hear someone scream in the middle of the night, I may be a little bit confused. So I'm going to add confused. to my chart. Great job. Okay, let's continue reading one more page. Destruction all around. When her, when her mother looked out of the window, she saw something large and white float by. It was the house next door. Before the night was over, thousands of homes were destroyed. Sarah's family and their house survived the storm. On the scene, the storm surge destroyed everything between Sarah's house and the beach. She wrote, the water went down very rapidly, and soon it was daylight Sunday morning. We looked out of the window, and of all the beautiful houses between our house and the beach, not one was left. In the chaos after the storm, many people did not know where help would come from. Here... Supply wagons are delivering much-needed food supplies. So I'm going to go back up here to where Sarah said, the water went down very rapidly, and soon it was daylight Sunday morning. We looked out of the window, and of all the beautiful houses between our house and the beach, not one was left. How would you feel if you looked out in your neighborhood and all of the houses were destroyed? Yeah, I might feel sad too. Um, if I looked out and saw all my neighbor's houses were destroyed, that would make me um, very sad or very upset. So I'm going to check that off. So I think Sarah also feels sad or upset. And again, I want you to be adding this to your chart with me at home. Alrighty, disaster. The Galveston hurricane is the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. More than 6,000 people drowned or were killed by flying debris. The Category 4 hurricane destroyed 3,636 houses. For the survivors, there was no clean water to drink and very little food. The Red Cross and other relief groups rushed to help. Rebuilding. When the people of Galveston rebuilt their city, they built a seawall to protect against high waves. Engineers began to raise the level of the city by 5 meters, or six, 17 feet, at the seawall to prevent flooding. It was a huge job, but it helped protect Galveston from future disasters. And here we have a picture of a man who stands at the top of a portion of Galveston's new seawall. On the scene... Clara Barton wrote letters to the U.S. government from Galveston about the flood. On September 18, 1900, she wrote, There seems to be an unusually large number of children with no one to take care for them or who knows them. We will help them as far as possible, gather them in, and the world will give them homes. How do you think those, those kids felt with no one to take care of them? Yeah, I agree. They may have felt lonely. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check off here. So I think after a storm, this proves that people may feel lonely. And this is a picture of Claire Barton. And then last thing, New York City children raised $27,907 um, to help the children of Galveston. So, so far, we've read about the Galveston hurricane, and we've proved that before a hurricane, 
someone may feel scared during a hurricane, someone may feel scared or terrified, and then after a hurricane, people may feel scared and lonely. We are now going to read about a hurricane in New Orleans, Louisiana in 2005. As I read, I'm not going to stop, but I want you to take your notes. How does someone feel before, during, and after a hurricane? And I want you to add it to your chart, and we'll talk about that once we're done. So New Orleans, Louisiana, 2005. On August 28, 2005, a storm in the Gulf of Mexico developed into a Category 5 hurricane. It headed toward the Louisiana and Mississippi coast of the United States. Chris's story. 11-year-old Chris Nungesser lived in a suburb of New Orleans, Louisiana. He was watching TV as a meteorologist predicted that Hurricane Katrina would hit New Orleans. It freaked us out, Chris said. Everyone in the neighborhood began boarding up windows and gathering emergency supplies. And here we have a map of the route that Hurricane Katrina took. Leaving home. People were ordered to evacuate. About 960,000 out of 1.2 million people in New Orleans left the area. Chris and his family went to New Iberia, Louisiana. Roads were jammed with traffic. When Chris reached New Iberia, he watched TV reports of rain gushing into the streets of New Orleans. Dikes surrounding the city had broken and the streets filled with water. Stuck in the city. Not everyone could leave New Orleans. Many who stayed were too sick, too old or sick to leave. Others were poor. They had no car and public transportation was not working. And here we have a picture of floodwaters that covered the city of New Orleans. And you can see in this picture, all you can see are the roofs of the houses. Everything else is filled with water. Number crunching. In total, 1,833 people died because of Hurricane Katrina. In Louisiana, almost half of those who died were over 75 years old. Many were too sick or poor to leave their home. Temporary homes. Some evacuees stayed in disaster centers or were taken in by kind strangers. Others moved into temporary trailers provided by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. Chris and his family moved in with an aunt and uncle in Houston, Texas. He began attending a school in Houston. The other children were kind and the teachers were sympathetic. And here we have a picture of people laying, it looks like they're on cots, and the caption says, the Astrodome Sports Stadium in Houston, Texas was used as a disaster center to house hurricane evacuees. Returning home. Chris flew home in mid-October. Seeing the damage from above was frightening. He said he saw boats and houses sprawled over the roads. There was plenty of work ahead for the hurricane victims. Chris's family was lucky. Even though the first floor of their house was damaged, it could be fixed. Sewer water had backed up in the pipes of their house. It sank. And here we have a picture of people in boats. And it says, people in Metairie, where Chris lived, used boats to travel through the flooded streets. Helping hand. Talia Lemon of Iowa was 10 years old when Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans. She set up a website called randomkid.org to raise money for hurricane victims. In the first three months, children raised more than $5 million for hurricane victims. Okay, so I want you to think back. I want you to look over your notes. What notes did you add to your chart? How did people feel before the hurricane, during the hurricane, and after Hurricane Katrina? Okay, so you may have said that before the hurricane, 
people were nervous. So I'm going to add nervous to my chart. In our text, Chris said that it freaked him out. So he was frightened or nervous. Any of those words could work. Now, how about during the storm? Now, we know Chris didn't stay in New Orleans for the storm. Instead, he went to New Iberia and he was watching storm cover the storm coverage on TV. So he could see his home being destroyed. He could see the streets flooding, but he couldn't do anything to stop it. How do, you think, how do you think that made Chris feel? I agree. I think Chris may have felt maybe helpless. There was nothing that he could do to help the situation. And then lastly, how do you think Chris felt after the hurricane? Well, I can see here in my text, it says, Seeing the damage from above was frightening. Um, and his house was destroyed. So I think he might have felt scared or frightened. Great job. I hope you, your chart looks similar to mine. Alrighty. So last thing we're going to do. We're almost done. How do the emotions and feelings of the people in the text help to reveal the main idea of the text. So the main idea is what the text is all about. So I want to look over my chart, and I see here that there are some words that are repeated. Scared, anxious, terrified, those are all very similar. So if the author proved that over and over again, that people felt scared, terrified, lonely, during or before or after a hurricane, I think that this text, the main idea might be that hurricanes are frightening and dangerous. All right, great job, guys. So in this lesson, you have read Surviving Hurricanes and learned about children's feelings before, during, and after a hurricane. You also practiced identifying the main idea, or what the text is all about, of a nonfiction text and supporting it with key details. Thank you so much for watching. Um, bye, guys.